Hare Krishna, welcome. This video will be in English, normally we have videos in German, but this time because my interview partner here, Paramananda Prabhu, also known as uh, Porcel, yes. uh, a musician in the hardcore scene and also a yoga teacher yes. and long time devotee, mm -hmm. um, is giving us the opportunity to talk with him and ask him about his uh, view of life and about Krishna consciousness. So without further ado, I'd like to ask you, maybe you can tell us a bit about how you became a devotee and especially how you came from this background to a very devotional lifestyle. Okay. That would be interesting. You know, it's, it's, my story is a little bit interesting because most people become, a devo become devotees because they're materially distressed. And, you know, even Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that people come to him out of distress and they, and they feel like they need something in life and, um, or they're, you know, they want money or, you know, life just isn't really going well for them. And so it's in those times of distress that people take shelter of God. My story is almost the exact opposite. My story is almost like a story of material exhaustion because, you know, when I was young, I was in bands. And, you know, me and Raghunath, when we were very young, we started this band called Youth of Today. And so I, I started that band when I was 18 years old. And almost immediately the band got really big. You know, so I was like 18, I was like practically a kid. And all of a sudden I'm touring all over the world, you know, playing these big shows, playing to thousands of people. And, uh, you know, so it just happened like really quick that, you know, I wasn't in, I wasn't like Guns N' Roses or, you know, rock star big, but in, in the own little, you know, punk scene, hardcore scene, you know, the band actually got, you know, pretty big. We sold a lot of records. So when Youth Today broke up, I moved to California and I was probably like 22 years old. And most people would look at me and they would think like, this guy's got it all. <laughs> like I had tons of money. I was working at a record label. The only thing I had to do was I would pick the bands for record labels. So I literally worked like one night a week. Like I would go to shows on like a Saturday night and I would try to sign bands. And the rest of the time I got paid and I would just go to the beach and I would surf and I had money and I had like a, you know, one of these like California looking blonde haired girlfriends. And so people would be like, wow, that guy's got it all. You know, he's 22 years old, 22 years old. He's, you know, got, you know, he was in a popular band. I was actually about to start a band. I don't know if you've ever heard of the band Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, of course. But, you know, they were a huge band yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. And so the singer lived in Huntington Beach, and me and the singer were going to start a band. So there was all this hype. Oh, my God, the guy from Youth Today is starting a band with the, you know, the, you know, the singer. He wasn't in Rage Against the Machine yet, but people mm -hmm. were still pretty excited about it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's funny because you know, I had popularity, had money, had you know, fame, all these things that people knock themselves out to get. And quite honestly, I was completely unfulfilled. And I was very confused. I'm like 22 years old. I was like, I don't get it. Like, what else can I add to my life that's going to you know, kind of bring this X factor into my life that's sort of missing? And I really could not figure it out. And I was in, I was in a lot of anxiety about it. Because, you know, a lot of people will be after these kind of like material things. And they'll be after fame, they'll be after followers, they'll be after, you know, money. And it's almost like a carrot on a stick. They never quite get it, so they spend their life sort of chasing it, and then they die. <laughs> but me, at a very young age, for some reason, I was just kind of gifted these things. And I realized that, you know, these things just don't satisfy you. Mm -hmm. And so I really was just at a loss in my life. I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I moved from California and I moved back to New York and I knew it had something to do with spirituality because I knew that that was pretty much the only thing in my life that I didn't have. And so I didn't know where to start. I just went to kind of like bookstores and I would get books on Buddhism. I've read the Bhagavad Gita. You know, it wasn't Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. But um, I really kind of went on a search of to find out what that thing was that was missing in my life. And... Uh, I had a couple of really deep moving experiences that moved me towards Krishna. The one thing was someone said, hey, the Christians are having a big parade today in New York City. It was, it was the day of Rath Yatra. So I just happened to be by Fifth Avenue where the Rath Yatra was coming down. And I walked down and the carts were coming down and the kirtan was so intense. I remember just sitting there on Fifth Avenue like watching these like 
Hare Krishna devotees jumping up and down and singing. And just like the intensity and the prayer that they were singing with, I was just like, wow. I mean, it had such a big impression on me. And you know, the big carts and the deities were all coming down. And I was just like, wow. You know, that was like my first kind of real experience, you know, with Kirtan. And so that actually had a profound impact on me. And uh, I knew a little bit about Krishna from the hardcore scene because that band, the Chrome Mags, were into Krishna. So I knew a little tiny bit about it. But um, another, to- uh, another kind of big thing that sort of moved me out of the, the confusion of trying to find a path in so many different paths that you can choose from is... Um, my one friend who was a hardcore kid and I just knew him from the hardcore scene he became a devotee and he was living at Gita Nagri and he had moved to New York and his guru was Satsarut Maharaj and so he said hey it's my guru's appearance day and they're going to have a big thing at the temple do you want to come because he knew I was kind of into spiritual stuff so I was like yeah sure he goes well the only thing is it starts at um five o'clock in the morning so you got to come at five o'clock in the morning I was like whoa (laughs) I'm a musician I'm like going to bed at five o'clock in the morning so we woke up early we took the train we went out to um, the Brooklyn Temple which in itself I don't know if you've ever been there it's like a big huge beautiful building beautiful temple room so even just like walking in I was just you know you're in on reverence just because you know the deities are really really big and the the altar is really beautiful yeah Radha Govinda and I remember you know, you know, just hearing all the disciples, you know, speeches that they were giving to their offerings to Satsarut Maharaj. And there was so much love in that room and just, you know, people just pouring out their hearts, you know, in gratitude to their, to their spiritual master. And I was just like, you know, when you're living in a material world, people just don't give a crap about each other. And so when you get into that environment where, you know, people have these like really deep spiritual loving relationships that are based on, you know, putting Krishna in the center, it's like something you've never experienced before, you know, just you know, being in around people that are just, you know, basically out to, you know, out for themselves. And so I was like, wow. And then, you know, when Sasru Mar- Maharaj started talking, And here he is, he's being literally worshipped by a whole, and plus there was a ton of people there. I mean, the temple room was packed. Which year was this? This was um, 1992. Mm -hmm. And Satsuru Maharaj started speaking, and he was so humble, and he just kind of deferred all the glory and all the worship, you know, to Prabhupada. And even that was super moving for me, Mm -hmm. because, you know, All the people that I knew, if they were being glorified, they just want to be glorified more. And here's this person that's at the center of attention. He's this big teacher. All these people are pouring out their hearts to him. And he's just, you know, very humble, just saying, well, anything you see in me, any good that you see in me, it's all just all due to my spiritual master. And I was like, wow. These people have something that I've never come across before, and I want to find out more about it. So my fr- the same friend that invited me, he was going to move back to Gidanagri. And he asked me, he said, do you want to come? And I thought about it. And I just kind of said, yeah, yeah, I'll go. And he goes, no, but we're going to go there. We're going to move there. We're going like, to live there. We're going to be brahmacharis. And I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do it. Because I was just so intrigued with, with Krishna and, you know, and just so impressed with Krishna's devotees that I literally sold everything that I owned. And I moved to Gidanagri and was milking cows and stuff like that. So that was, and it all happened really fast. Yeah. I went from seeing that Rathiatra and then, you know, six months later I was living at Gidanagri. So it's just kind of like, just kind of stumbled into it. So the change was because you were so inspired by the whole thing that such a change from a rock star kind of lifestyle is right. all you want to have you have it to mm-hmm. such a simple life it was because this fulfillment was so strong you didn't mind no, no problem for you i didn't mind at all i I, I loved it you know especially coming from this like really intense rock and roll traveling lifestyle yeah. you know for years you know the punk scene people moshing people stage diving and you know it's pretty intense in you know the mode of passion <laughs> <laughs> so just being at gita Nagri in the mode of goodness yeah. It's such a relief. 
Um, so, and it was almost like a, it was almost like a detox from intense material life. Mm -hmm. And so I just got to be by my own, you know, I was living in this natural environment. Like I said, I was like, you know, farming and milking cows and, you know, going to the morning program and hearing the classes. And it was just really nice. Mm -hmm. You know, people are after so many things in this world, but when you get a little peace, you're just like, oh my God, this is what I'm looking for. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was something, it was special. So, sure. but at that time, did you think maybe it's long ago, but that what I did before, that's over? Yes. Or you, or you thought maybe it will come back? Or no, you no. You thought no. that's it and now I'm... Yeah. I was pretty much resigned to just stay at Gita Nagri for the rest of my life. <laughs> How long it would have lasted? I, you know, probably not long. Um, you know, because you got to do the things that come natural to you. You can't, you know, even Bhagavad Gita is all about that. You can't just artificially adopt someone else's you know, path yeah. and, and call it your own. You have to follow your own path. And I was always a musician. I was always kind of like, and I was not only a musician, I was, I was the type of person that wanted to play music to kind of support higher ideals or introduce higher ideals. Like Youth of Today, we were a hardcore band, but we were always about straight edge, mm -hmm. not drinking, vegetarianism, mm -hmm. positive living. Mm -hmm. And so... It wasn't just the music, it was the message also that I was really well, how into. How did you come to that message, to this kind of renunciation? Was there some spirituality involved? Or what gave, gave the impetus for such a going away from... You mean when we joy? first do it? Yeah, the, the, you know the, what? It was just pe some, some past life, something or other, that oh. we were just... You know, me and Raghunath were just kind of... You know, it's funny because I must have um, just kind of worked out whatever attachments I had to intoxication in a past life because I was, you know, even when I was a little kid, I would go to parties and just out of peer pressure, you know, I would drink and, you know, stuff like that. I smoked pot maybe just a few times, not really into it. But I was never really attracted to intoxication, like at all. Like I never liked it. I never liked being drunk. So for that, it was, I didn't have to work up to any renunciation. I just wasn't into it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had worked that out previously, and um, and just the at the attachment to living for something kind of greater than your than yourself. That was always something that even before I met devotees, I just kind of had this natural inclination towards. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure where it came from, but mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you find Krishna, all that's all the pieces of the puzzle that yeah. you're looking for, they kind of fall into place yeah. and they start to make sense. But it's true that I didn't want anything to do with hardcore. And you know, this is way before like the internet, this is way before cell phones. Gita Nagri had one phone in their office and there was barely anybody in the office because there was only a few people that lived there and everybody was out taking care of the cows. Mm. And so little did I know that Raghunath was doing the band Shelter, which was the Krishna core band Shelter, and their guitar player had quit. And he left to do the band 108. And so they were looking for a guitar player and they couldn't find one. They went to India, they came back, they still couldn't find one. And some kid, some hardcore kid came to the temple and he said, why don't you just get Purcell, the guitar player for you today? He's a devotee now. He's living at Gitanagri. And they were like, what? He's looking at Gitanagri, he's a devotee? You know, they were freaked out. And like I said, you know, these were much simpler times before you could really get in touch with people. So Raghunath kept on trying to call Gita Nagri to make sure that I was actually living there and he couldn't, no one was picking up the phone. Yeah. And so finally he, uh, he got through to somebody and they said, he said, is there a person living in the temple, his name's Purcell. And the guy said, the devotee said, there is a couple of new people here, but I don't know what, I don't know what his name is. <laughs> I'm not like out in the field, like all day long, like working. And he said, and Raghunath said, well, what does he look like? And the guy said, you know, Raghunath, he kind of looks like you. And Raghunath's like, that's the guy. <laughs> so I didn't even know about that. I didn't know about the phone call. I didn't know anything. I was in the barn shoveling cow manure into the, into, into the wagons, so, you know, spread the manure on the fields. And I'm like, you know, knee deep in cow poop shoveling. And then all of a sudden, Raghunath and the whole band of shelter, they just came there. And they just walked in. I was like... Raghunath, what are you, I hadn't seen him in years. And I was like, Raghunath, what are you doing here? And he was like, this is so great. 
we're going to get you in shelter. It's going to be just like the old times. We're going to play music, but we're going to play it for Krishna. It's going to be fantastic. And um, I was like, Raghunath, I'm sorry that you drove all the way down here because there's no way I'm doing hardcore again. I was like, I'm just not jumping back into the fire. Like, I finally crawled my way out of that hole. I'm not jumping back in. Um, and uh, Raghunath's a really persuasive person, <laughs> to say the least. And he's a really good preacher. And so I really, you know, even though I had been living at the temple for a few months, I really, you know, it's new, so I didn't really know so much about the philosophy. And he started preaching to me. And he started saying, like, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, it's not what you do, it's how you do it, and the consciousness that you do it that makes all the difference. So you can sit on this farm. You're not a farmer. You know it. I know it. You'll probably, he, and he was like, I've seen this before. You'll probably last six months because it's not a natural service for you. And then you'll get frustrated and you'll, you, you'll wonder, you know, what your next step is. He said, you're a communicator. You're a really good guitar player. You're, you, you have this kind of like charismatic ability to, you know, talk to people and, you know, um, spread a message to people. He's like, that's what you should be doing. He's like, that's your path in this, in this life, like it or not. He said, so why don't you try something different? Why don't you try for doing it for Krishna instead of yourself? And I was like, you know what? Maybe I will. That kind of makes sense to me. Like, you know, when he explained it in the light of the Bhagavad Gita, it actually made sense. And so I took it as kind of an experiment to try. Like, okay, I'll do music, but this time I'm going to try very hard that I'm just going to do it for Krishna. And so I joined Shelter, and it was really like, it was, it was totally different. Like when you do what you do, but you do it for Krishna in the mood of service, it becomes a completely different thing. And I experienced that. It didn't matter if there's a hundred, you know, a lot of times when you're in a band, if a thousand people come to your shows, you're all excited. If a hundred people show up, you're, you're really bummed out and depressed. It's like, there wasn't that roller coaster. It didn't matter anymore. Mm. Like, if a hundred people came and you talked to people about Krishna, great. A thousand people come and you talk to people about Krishna, great. You know, it's just like, um, you're not so worried about the material results anymore. It's more about what you can contribute and what you can kind of leave these people with and, and you can just take what, whatever little you know and if you can just kind of like you know, tell people that, that's what really matters. And I found that when we did it in that way, it was super fulfilling. And you know, all the bad stuff that comes with you know, doing anything where you're in like the public eye, there's always like competition and envy and, but you know, when you do something in the, in the spirit of devotion, you don't get all the, all the bad stuff. You just get the good stuff. So it was, it was really nice. I really loved doing it. You reached many people. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what did change from then to now? And what is now the reason that you are now on tour again? And is this kind of a revival? Or no, do you it's a new thing? Uh, you it's have some vision for the future? No, I mean, I've pretty much... I don't do music full time at all anymore. But you know, pretty much, uh, you know, due to the nature of the internet, all these old bands that I did, they're actually super popular. We can play all around the world. And so, a few times of the year, you know, I get together with my friends, and you know, we go out, and we travel, and you know, we we play some music, and it's just kind of like a a nice thing for me to just be able to you know get out and travel. You know, Shelter started playing again too, which is really nice, and uh, you know, the whole band's devotees, so that's really nice. Uh, But, you know, now it's just kind of like a, a fun ho yeah. hobby, more or less. It's not like a, a real Christian like, core revival or anything like that. Before it was like your, your mission, kind of. Yeah. You had a mission also. Yeah. So now it's more... You know, Matt, now I'm grown up and, you know, I have kids <laughs> and, you know, I can't do it full time anymore. Yeah, just, course. you know, get in a van and, and travel till the wheels fall off like we used to do. But, uh, you know... It's sort of a young man's game anyway to, to you know, travel that much and, and do that, so. And um, what do you... Unless you're a sannyasi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Then it's an old man's game, <laughs> too. And what do you say about the scene nowadays? Would there be a potential if there would come a new Hare Krishna core, Krishna core band that there is a potential for something like this again? Or was it just the 90s? Was there something special about this? Or what You know what's weird? I can't, I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. Just in the 90s, there was this like bubble of, you know, where Krishna was just 
part of the scene. And you would just see kids with neck beads on and you know, we'd be at the table and kids would be buying chocolate beads. It was a fascinating phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what the setting was or you know, what the environment and culture was that made that popular at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem like you know, later on it became a big thing. It was kind of like a wave that came and it, and it crashed. Mm -hmm. I don't know, young kids, get out there. <laughs> Brahmacharis, get in the van, play some music, see if, see if people will, will be into it again. Well, I think it was because you were naturals, you were, it was authentic. If, like, if some Brahmacharis would think now, yeah, what true. is the cool music now, let's do that, it won't work. Yeah, that's true. Were we, we were already from the scene. You know, it's, it's almost like in India, if you take sannyas, people will listen to you because they respect sannyasis and they want to hear what you have to say. In America, we were from the scene, we were in these popular bands, so people wanted to kind of listen to us and, and hear what we had to say. So for us, it was all we, you know, we had already spent years kind of cultivating that and kind of cultivating the whatever, the re, you know, the respect of people or, you know, just the, just the attention of people. So it was and very natural in that, in that sense. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, but how did the scene actually react to you guys becoming devotees? Um, when we first became devotees, there was a huge backlash in the punk scene about it. Because mm -hmm. you know, punk is, always, is all about, you know, no gods, no masters, you know, everything is kind of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, you know, make your own way. And so we, when we came out and, you know, we're talking about, you know, God, people flipped out. You know, even the first time we came to Europe, people picketed the shows. There'd be a bunch of punk rockers outside with signs, you know, no gods, no this, no that. And it was tough. Like, people, you know, there were some people that were into it and it was kind of polarized. It would either be people that were, you know, curious about it. And then the other half of the people were hostile. And, you know, throwing bottles at us. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was pretty crazy that, like, when I first joined the band in 1992, things were... They were very like polarized like that. Later on, like by the time we put out, you know, we put out another record and then we put out our biggest record, which was on a way bigger label, it was called Mantra. Yeah. And we started touring all over the world and we were selling hundreds of thousands of records. Yeah. I think people, I think people took the time to sort of read the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And Raghunath is such, he's not only like a talented lyricist, but he just has this knack of ways to present Krishna consciousness where it makes sense and relevance, you know, just to whatever the average, you know, music listener. And so I think that people read the lyrics and they're just like, you know what, this is actually kind of cool. Like, I'm into what they're talking about. You know, I, I, I agree with a lot of this stuff. So I think it was maybe like that first year that things were very um, antagonistic, but after that, People actually were very friendly and very open to it, yeah. which was nice. As far as I remember, this was also my first contact to Krishna consciousness because uh -huh. on the mantra you chant the Panchatattva Maha Mantra in the beginning. Yeah, and we did I, that every show. We played that. Yeah. And when I heard this, I was maybe 14 or 13 at that time, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what is that. It's it was very mystical actually. Isn't it mystical? We used to play that whole. I think it's um, Purusha Shukta. And then it ends with the Om Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda. Yeah. And even like when, you know, I heard it a million times because that was our intro tape. Yeah. And I'd be on stage and that would come on. It's just like, whoa, that's so <laughs> mystical sounding, isn't it? Like that sound vibration is powerful. Very powerful, yeah. Yeah. So, I agree. Very nice. So, um, maybe you can tell something about uh, your spiritual side, maybe what is your favorite part of Bhagavad Gita, shloka, something of your spiritual realization throughout your life. You're also uh, a little older now. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, uh, you know, now I'm actually super into the Bhagavatam. When I was a brahmachari, I read the whole Bhagavatam cover to cover. I you know, read Chaitanya Charitamrita. You know, it was just part of my sadhana living in the temple that we would read every morning. And so I read it and even, you know, as, of course, as a brahmachari living in the temple, you get a lot of realizations from it. But I just, um, maybe like a year or so ago, I started rereading it. And, you know, when you're living outside of the temple, you get a whole different set of realizations because you're, you're kind of trying to walk that line between your material life and your spiritual life. And I find um, 
as a person that's kind of living outside of the temple now, I even have a deeper appreciation for the Bhagavatam. And uh, you know, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the uh, sixth canto right now, and just those Prabhupada purports are just like so incredible. And you know, it's just like anything else, the older that you get and the more that you practice something. Uh, you know, the kind of deeper you get into it. So I'm just really having a super big appreciation for the Bhagavatam these days. Nice. It's just fascinating. Like Prabhupada was just, he was so ahead of his time. Like a lot of that stuff that was in the purports that when he wrote in like the 60s and the 70s, those things aren't even unfolding to like now. You know, when he talks about, you know, world leaders and, you know, just the way that, uh, that world leaders are just into, into it for, you know, corporate interests and how, you know, technology is, is um, actually going to, you know, ruin the environment. And even like things like when he's talking about, you know, vegetarianism is, you know, better for the environment. All these things that he put in purports in the 60s, just now they're coming into the, you know, mainstream public consciousness. And I'm just like, wow, you know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's timeless. Yeah. It's timeless knowledge. Yeah. He says uh, that this will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. Yeah. And it's really like that. It really is. And it will become more relevant, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's true. And we should be able to understand it properly, mm -hmm. to present it also in mm -hmm. these needful times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I read the, uh, the fourth canto with um, Pritu Maharaj. And that whole part of the ba Bhagavatam is all about world leaders and um, you know how if world leaders become spiritually minded the whole world will change and it's almost like a little like I wish you know in, in America we have this one candidate that's running for um, mm. that's that's running for president her name's Tulsi Gabbard she's a devotee uh, you know she came to the she came to New York Rathi Atra this year she led a kirtan like she's really like and she's a sincere person and I was just thinking of God, I hope she reads this part of the fourth canto because it's all about how to be a leader in a Krishna conscious way for the benefit of all the people. Maybe you can tell her, send her a message. I actually tried. <laughs> I don't know if she ever read it. I mean, she must get like hundreds of thousands of messages. But I did Instagram her. Hey, I just read this part of the Bhagavatam. You're running for president. Please read it. <laughs> but yeah. But I also, th I think it would be very nice if she makes it, but the chances... Statistically speaking, a little low. Yeah. But at least this is already one step in mm -hmm. this direction. Who yeah. knows what will come in future? She's still and young too. She could run again in four years. Exactly. You never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know what Krishna has planned. Yeah, yeah. This would be a huge thing. Yeah. That would be like already this is a huge thing that a Hare Krishna running for president. This yeah. Already. Yeah. Maybe for America it's big, but for Europe even bigger in one sense, especially mm. Germany, the Hare Krishna movement at times is seen, still seen as a cult. Yeah. I'm from Austria, which uh -huh. is even more conservative. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna is more or less a cult. Mm -hmm. they are a little bit it's not like that in America yeah, anymore. That's what I mean. Yeah. Due to the popularity of yoga. Yeah. Like yoga is just insanely popular in America now. You know, there's a yoga studio in every major city on every other block practically. You know, so things like karma and bhakti and, you know, these things are almost becoming like household names and it's funny too because all these things that are coming that people are becoming fascinated by in like the yoga scene you know Harry Christians have been doing it for you know decades you know meditation mantra meditation kirtan you know now just like regular everyday yoga people what's kirtan all about we want to do kirtan where can I buy harmonium you know it's just like where can I buy cartels you know all this stuff that we've just been doing and people have been making fun of us for <laughs> you know since the 60s now people are like whoa tell me about this how can i get into this stuff so and it's really cool you know because you know Raghunath, the singer for shelter is he's like a very well-known yoga yeah. teacher that travels all around the world and he gets yoga teach he gets really popular yoga teachers that will go to his teacher trainings because you just can't find out about this stuff you know by whatever just you know regular channels you have to find a person that's lived it and you know you know uh read books about it you know for decades and it becomes a, a different kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's pretty cool that uh you know Hare christian devotees are sort of leading the way mm -hmm. in at least in the american yoga scene i don't know so much about europe no, no. Actually, now we are also getting into contact with one of the biggest yoga schools in Germany, mm -hmm. Yoga Vidya. They mm -hmm. have a huge thing, and mm -hmm. slowly we get. Before we were not so how mm -hmm. to say accepted there, mm -hmm. but now this is changing. 
Yeah. Don't, don't worry, when it gets really popular in America, Europe yeah. will pick up on it. Still, still <laughs> Even Prabhupada knew that. Prabhupada went to New York first because he said, things that become popular in New York will become popular in the whole entire world. <laughs> so it's happening in America. It'll happen yes. in Europe for sure. And um, yeah, so we're optimistic for the future. Yeah, yeah, looks, big time. It doesn't look, because some people are black, uh, having this black vision about future. Really? Oh, Why? Uh, oh my God. ISKCON has changed so much and all this. Uh -huh. Inside ISKCON, outside ISKCON, mm -hmm. very negative view on life. Mm -hmm. so we can also contribute and say, actually, we have everything in our hands. We, could, we can change it. Mm -hmm. Atma van manya te you got. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, if you're kind of a negative person, that's how you're going to see the, you know, the world and the movement or whatever. Yeah. I'm super optimistic. I mean, I'm optimistic because I just see how many everyday people are becoming interested in bhakti. So it seems like there's going to be a, a huge bhakti explosion. Mm -hmm. So more channels are opening. The more oh we yeah, continue yeah. and persist in yeah. our ways. Yeah, I mean the biggest yoga festival in America is called Bhakti Fest. Mm -hmm. They have Kirtan and Gauravani as a regular chanter there. Radna Swami goes every single year, and you know tons of just regular everyday yogis go and you know, hear what he has to say. That's the most popular. That's the most popular yoga festival in the country where yoga is the most popular. Mm -hmm. It's called Bhakti Fest. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing when you think about it. Yeah. And which other fields in life do you see a how to say positive change? Maybe because we have four minutes more. So yeah. Uh, I'm, not like a, I'm, I'm not. I'm uh, not. You know that's. Or, or maybe you can give us an end word. Some like. As we are now talking about like positive changes, some uh -huh. like a positive uh, message for the viewers, maybe for the individual life or also uh, You know, keep chanting because Hare Krishna is cool now. <laughs> Hare Krishna is cool, yes. cool now. Keep chanting; it's only going to get bigger and more popular. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And now you will play. Yep. Some music. Now I go play some crazy music. A bunch of people are going to stage dive. <laughs> <laughs> so All right. Very well. And whenever you have time, come to Sumatra. I would love to come back there. Such a beautiful place. When have you been last time there? Uh, that's the Shringadev Temple in the Black Forest. Mm -hmm. We went there with shelter a few times. Oh, yeah, so it's really nice. Yeah, we were there on the Shringadev uh, once. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. Yeah. It went to, through many phases. Now we have a very nice mood there. More, uh, uh, 40 devotees living there. Really it's great. Nice worship. It mm -hmm. would be nice if you have time sometimes. Mm -hmm. By your mercy, please pray for me. All right, sure. <laughs> thank you so All right, much. Well. All right thank you.